as you see my still signs so right Yes, I, I will okay. keep an eye. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, as uh, Greg has already done this, so in order to save time, I will be very brief about thanking John and Mike uh, 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 on the, and congratulating them on this enormous effort, which I think is of critical importance to scholarship even today. Uh, perhaps uh, 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 if we make it uh, less important in time, then they will have accomplished their task. Because the reason why John's scholarship remains very important today is because the questions with which these volumes deal remain unresolved. The left has debated and disputed them without arriving at any satisfactory resolutions. I feel that this particular volume and all of these volumes actually, they uh, I want to take a really step back and take a big picture view of this. I think they stand at a very critical moment in history. They, they, they testify to a very critical moment in history um, and uh, around which a number of questions arise. Uh, one, quest, one title I could give to my remarks would be Reforms, Reformism and Revolution. Another title I could give is What Does Internationalism Really Mean? Uh, and so let me just, uh, 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 just uh, go right into it. Basically, we are, we are standing at a moment in time when uh, uh, and more than 100, and, well, actually 150 odd years since uh, next year it will be since Capital was written. We are still standing, uh, we are still living in a world in which the successful revolutions that have taken place have taken place in the third world, whereas in the West there has been no revolution as expected uh, uh, by, well, as expected by the Second International. I wouldn't necessarily pin it on Marx. Uh, so that, you know, the Russian Revolution, when it occurred, was called the Revolution Against Capital. Um, and I would like to wager that there, are, there is one key term which is basically uh, uh, the misunderstanding of which uh, has, uh, has, leaves us in this position of, of continuing uh, long disputes without arriving at resolution and that key term is the nation state. Um, I'm just going to make a few discrete points about that. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that, uh, in the, as you can see, even in these debates, there are often, uh, there are often uh, words, forms of words which tend to mislead us. We tend to imagine that we can label this or that activity or demand reformist or revolutionary in advance. I don't think this is the case. I think that demands for reform, in a, demands for the most minimal reform can become revolutionary in certain historical circumstances and those circumstances require at least two things. A ruling class which is unable or unwilling to grant them and an insurrectionary class which is able to organize the achievement of those goals on its own. I think once those things are, uh, uh, are, are, are uh, uh, once we have those things, then effectively you have a revolutionary situation. After all, uh, the Bolshevik uh, slogan in the Russian Revolution was actually quite modest. Peace, bread, and land. What could be more bourgeois than that? Uh, uh, so in that sense, uh, I, I, so I just want to put that out. Uh, secondly, I would like to say that if these volumes mark a transition in the international workers' movement from the Second International to the Third International. Clearly, Second International broke apart precisely on the question to which it actually paid no attention, the existence of nation states. I would say that there are two points to note here about that. The first thing is that uh, the Second International, to some extent, the ign ignoring of the nation state was perhaps understandable because when the, the Second International was born at a point when the national organization of Europe was only getting into its stride. And so in that sense, you can imagine that they perhaps tended to carry along ideas of, uh, 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 of uh, 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 an international working class, which was still relatively uh, undeveloped. Uh, and I feel that a lot of the times you find in the Second International and in many quarters of Marxist quarters today, uh, uh, in the name of internationalism, you find what is in fact a cosmopolitanism. A cosmopolitanism basically is a way of looking at the world whose division into nation states does not matter. It is materially inconsequential. And internationalism would take them seriously. I would say that Marx and Engels uh, belong to that tradition, the latter tradition. And I would say that, uh, uh, that, the, that the Comintern, the Russian revolutionaries, were increasingly forced towards that position. But let's first take, uh, uh, let me first say about the Second International that uh, they tended, in fact, as I say, to take a cosmopolitan position. And part of the reason why they were undermined 
by that very existence of the nation state in 1914 has precisely to do with this because, to put it very simply, the second international, the component constituent parties of the second international um, mobilized the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the allegiance of the working class essentially by winning reforms from their respective nation states. This was the actual reality. This is how they were, won working class allegiance. The result was that, as, as, uh, 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 that by the time 1914 came along, the working class was no longer a working class that had nothing to lose but its chains. It was a working class that had something to lose and their respective nation states had given it to them. This is the important thing to remember. I'm not saying that what happened in 1914 was justified, but I think that if it had been taken better fully into account by the leaders of the Second International, it would, might have made a bigger difference. So that's, that's one sense. So, in, so then in, in the context of the Russian Revolution, basically the revolution against capital, as uh, Gramsci called it, what begins to become important is that when the revolution happens, the Bolsheviks are waiting for revolution to occur in Western Europe. This is repeated at various points in the text that we're talking about today. But it does not materialize. By contrast, there are all sorts of ferment uh, in, the, in, the, in the colonial world, etc., to which increasingly uh, uh, this international looks. John has edited uh, uh, also a, a volume of proceedings on, on the Baku Congress, which is, uh, becomes important in this context. And uh, uh, historically, I would say that the communist tradition, the Comintern tradition, is much more open to trying to understand a revolution in the East and what it might mean, etc. Uh, 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 than the second international ever was. Um, so uh, then uh, uh, basically what I'm trying to say is that these, again, these texts are important because they give us access to ways of understanding uh, 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 how revolution might take place today, what internationalism might mean. It allows us to go back to the sources, how people thought about it in the heat of events and, and how we might think about it today because it is simply impossible that any revolution is going to take place in the world as a whole in one loud thunderclap. It has to be the case that it will take place in, uh, in different nations at different times, often with years, decades or more between them. So how are revolutions to sustain themselves as bits of revolutions uh, uh, taking place, you know, and, 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 and uh, yeah, basically sustain themselves and remain in some ways true to their original principles in these circumstances in particular countries. I think this question was very much before the Bolsheviks at that time. And I, I would say finally, therefore, that some version of the idea of uneven and combined development is necessary. And I say this because people misunderstand the, the, the concept of uneven and combined development. Marxists misunderstand it. Most Marxists either don't use the term at all. Some other Marxists use only the words uneven development to emphasize the importance of imperialism. A, 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 a third set of Marxists use the term uneven and combined development, but they reserve the idea of combined development for revolution in backward countries. But they forget that combined development as a form of an anti-imperialist development was already taking place in countries like the United States and uh, uh, Germany, which had to industrialize against the supremacy of, the, uh, of Britain. And that after 1917, Russia added communist combined development to that list. And so this framework, I would suggest, allows us to uh, understand uh, uh, the, the possibilities of, of internationalism, etc. gives us some kind of basic framework to understand this. Thank you.